Well, thank you for such a wonderful, um, warm introduction to the seminar series, and thanks to everyone for coming along to an, a rather rainy and gloomy London afternoon to um, to come to this seminar um, to this, e this afternoon. Um, and as Chris said, I would like to extend my thanks to the Birkbeck uh, Gender and Sexuality Studies Program for hosting me during my stay here in London. I'm going to begin this afternoon by recounting a slightly longer episode as a means of introducing some of the key players in my analysis of encounters between sexologists and psychoanalysts at, t at the turn of the century. And I'll be arguing that the figure of the child was central to this history of scientific dialogue in the years after 1900, but also symptomatic of a much wider reorientation towards the normal in early 20th century sex research. So one cool November evening in 1908, a group of 12 physicians and intellectuals gathered in Professor Sigmund Freud's Viennese apartment at the Berggasse 19 to discuss a new publication by Berlin psychiatrist and sexologist Albert Moll. This is not a photograph from that evening, but it's some of the members of the, um, of the society. So just seven months earlier, these men, for the first woman to join the group was Margareta Hilferding in 1910, had voted to formalise their weekly Wednesday gatherings by changing their name to the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. And on this particular evening, the publication up for discussion was a weighty tome of more than 300 pages, Albert Moll's Das Sexuelle Leben des Kindes, or The Sexual Life of the Child. Aimed at a broad audience of educators, lawyers, judges and fellow physicians, Moll's book was being touted in professional circles as the first thoroughgoing investigation of, of infant sexuality. As one reviewer commented, hitherto we did not have such a comprehensive and elaborate account of every aspect of the sexual life of the child. But the crucial factor for the gentlemen who had gathered in Freud's apartment this evening was that this book also represented the first reply from a contemporary sexual scientist to Freud's own psychoanalytic exploration of infant sexuality. Three years earlier, in 1905, Freud's three essays on the theory of sexuality had made waves by articulating concepts such as the Oedipal complex, the polymorphous perverse sexuality of the child, and the pregenital phases of infancy. Perhaps it was only to be expected that at this gathering of dedicated Freudians, Moll's study received a lukewarm response. Some in attendance noted points of interest, but others decried it as a stunning example of scientific ineptitude and plagiarism. And this reception was not entirely unprovoked. Moll was known as a politically conservative and rather difficult medical colleague, and in the opening chapter of his Sexual Life of the Child, he had bluntly downplayed psychoanalytic contributions to the field. Freud, Moll declared in that work, has not systematically studied the individual manifestations of the sexual life of the child. In contrast, he declared his own contribution to be the first comprehensive study of the subject. The minutes of that meeting recorded by the Society's young secretary, Otto Rank, revealed that the subsequent discussion of Moll's book raised the temperatures in the room. Physician Edward Hitchman dismissed it as a semi-scientific work, a mere compilation in which there is nothing original. Alfred Bass declared that Moll is not equal to psychoanalysis and has not grasped its essence. Well, hydrotherapist and neurologist Isidor Zadka, who was uh, soon to become known for his own studies of homosexuality and narcissism, criticised Moll's territorialism, lamenting that he considers it an intrusion into his personal domain if another person has also achieved something in this field. So Freud was among friends when it came his turn to speak, declaring Moll's book inadequate, inferior, and above all, dishonest. Freud's assessment is thoroughly infused with psychoanalytic logic, as he argues that Moll wrote his book only after the three essays led the Berlin sexologist to recognise the importance of child sexuality, and that Moll's subsequent denial of Freud's influence could be explained by his latent awareness of this fact. But the greater problem, Freud declared, was that Moll had read the three essays in such a partial manner that he failed to recognise its principal achievement in bringing together an overarching theory of normal and perverse sexual life and linking these possibilities to a universal polymorphous perverse predisposition in infancy. This early contest over who had the authority to definitively pronounce on the sexual life of the child 
came during a decade in which the disciplinary boundaries of psychoanalysis and sexology had so far been decidedly porous, at least in the German-speaking world. Earlier that same year, Moll had joined fellow Berlin-based sexologists Ivan Bloch and Magnus Hirschfeld as a member of Karl Abraham's newly established Berlin Psychoanalytic Society. 1908 also saw the appearance, although short-lived, of the first dedicated sexological journal, the Zeitschrift für Sexualwissenschaft, or the Journal of Sexual Science. Edited by Hirschfeld, early issues of, this, of the Zeitschrift are notable for their inclusion of articles by analysts such as Freud, Sadke, and Wilhelm Stiegel. So we see some of the interpenetrations between these two fields in this first decade of the new century. But we're also beginning to see increasing tensions between practitioners of sexology and psychoanalysis, two fields that were only still establishing themselves as distinct medical scientific entities. And it's these tensions that, that are the subject of my paper today. And at the heart of these scientific turf wars in the years around 1900, I'm arguing, was the figure of the child and the subject of child sexuality. So my concern is not so much with e explicating Freud's own quite well-trodden theories of child sexuality, but rather with examining how these were refracted through the lens of Finder CX sexology. In other words, how did sexologists respond to Freud's challenge to existing conceptions of the sexual instinct? And this question is also at the heart of the larger monograph project from which this research is drawn and which uh, Chris kindly uh, introduced as well with the, with the working title Sex Between Body and Mind. So this book project examines encounters between these, uh, between the more interdisciplinary medical scientific field of sexual science and the more narrowly, um, the, the more narrowly defined field of Freudian psychoanalysis. And I look particularly at the first few decades of the 20th century in the German speaking world. And of course, I look not only at debates around the sexual life of the child, but also around subjects such as the treatment of homosexuality, of war neurosis, or the role of the hormones in shaping sexual behaviours. My aim with this larger project is to challenge the still pronounced tendency within the history of sexuality to treat sexology and psychoanalysis as distinct silos of disciplinary knowledge production and to show how focusing instead on scientific dialogues around questions such as infant sexuality can produce a more integrated account of the making of modern sexual knowledge. And in particular, I'm concerned, as the, the working title of the, of the book suggests, with showing how the intellectual boundary between these two fields can't be strictly drawn along a nature-nurture line. So it wasn't simply a case of the sexologist coming down on the side of biology and the psychoanalyst focusing purely on the workings of the mind. The focus on the child in the years after 1900, as I'll argue in the next section of this paper, signalled a broadening out of the Scientia Sexualis from the study of the perversions that had dominated such pioneering works as Richard von Kraft Ebbing's Psychopathia Sexualis in 1886, and a move instead to explore human sexuality in all of its facets. This reorientation towards the normal was also symptomatic of an era that historians have described in terms of sexual modernity, a period during which, as Dagmar Herzog describes, something like a semi-coherent entity, a complex of physiological and emotional impulses and sensations, acts and ideals, took shape and was designated as sexuality in the collective imaginary. The second half of this paper then charts some of the ways in which psychoanalysts challenged existing sexological definitions of normal and pathological sexual behaviour in children, and considers sexological responses to that challenge. And I propose that these competing interpretations mark the start of a growing theoretical and also methodological divide between these fields. So this brings me to part one, embracing the normal for a modern sexual science. Historians of sexuality in recent years have repeatedly sought to critically interrogate ideas of the norm within and across disciplinary boundaries. And I'm thinking here of works such as Laura Doan's Disturbing Practices or Peter Kreil and Elizabeth Stevens' recently published Normality, a Critical Genealogy. As Doan points out, scholars have at present only the vaguest sense of how and when a new regulatory force we now call norm normality began to shape and influence how people thought about sexuality. Similarly, Robin Wigman and Elizabeth Wilson insist that ideas of norms and their diverse others 
might well be more dynamic and more politically engaging than queer critique has usually allowed. What then were the assumptions around normal and abnormal sexual development guiding early 20th century discussions of the child? It is a very remarkable fact, observed leading British sex psychologist Havelock Ellis in the psychiatric journal Alienist and Neurologist in 1901, and this essay was later reprinted in his Studies in the Psychology of Sex, that although for many years Sorry, that although for many years past, serious attempts have been made to elucidate the psychology of sexual perversions, little or no endeavour has been made to study the normal sexual emotions. Yet this should, Ellis insisted, be the central focus of sexual science, for normal sexual phenomena give the key to the abnormal. Such comments would not have gone unheeded by Ellis's German-speaking colleagues on the continent, where he'd enjoyed a strong reputation at least since the 1896 publication in German of his major work on sexual inversion, co-authored with John Addington Simmons. Ellis's emphasis on the need for sexual science to branch out and encompass the study of normal se human sexual development was, I'm suggesting, indicative of a much larger push among European and North American sex researchers at this period. At this point, the forensic emphasis of 19th century psychiatrists on those pathologized, in, on, sorry, on those pathologized inverts, fetishists, and masochists, whom Kraft Ebbing had once described as nature's stepchildren, started to be overshadowed by attempts to chart the, the diversity of human sexuality. And so there were all these in, quite encyclopedic often multi-volume works being produced at this period, um, which were at least um, allegedly at least attempting to address the entirety of human sexual life. And key examples in the German-speaking world include Moll's widely read 1897 study of the libido sexualis, Berlin dermatologist Ivan Bloch's The Sexual Life of Our Time, and Swiss psychiatrist August Forel's The Sexual Question, all of which were published within a few years either side of 1900. And of course, Ellis was also beginning work at this period on his studies in the psychology of sex. Such studies reflect the growing pressure on sexual science to address the larger biopolitical concerns of early 20th century modernity, as Lucy Bland and Laura Doan observe. Moll, for example, declared that having previously dealt with pathological manifestations in his 1891 study of sexual inversion, he now planned to investigate the normal sexual instinct. And Bloch's study marked a similar shift of gears. So his previous study um, in 1902 had been on contributions to an, etio to an etiology of the psychopathia sexualis. Um, and he was really moving with this study to investigate sexual life in its entirety. And even Magnus Hirschfeld, and this is perhaps the most notable um, in this lineup, because of the way that he was really known for his homosexual activism and scholarship at this period, declared in 1908 that the uncomplicated love between man and woman is the broad fertile current, the main artery of life, and thus also for sexual science. And within this wave of scholarship, childhood was frequently considered to hold the secrets to normal and perverse sexual development alike. So with this broader context, we come to part two, which is child sexuality and the Freudian intervention. The fascination with childhood as a unique stage of life can be traced back to at least the 18th century with studies by Enlightenment thinkers such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Johann Gottfried Herder and Samuel August Tissot. Interest in a so-called science of the child again spiked in the late 19th century, marked particularly by the 1877 publication of Charles Darwin's article, A Biographical Sketch of an Infant. This coincided with the growth of a growth of the perversion-driven scientia sexualis that I've just described. Accordingly, doctors such as Kraft Ebbing were beginning to conceptualise childhood behaviours such as masturbation as problems for the medical expert and move them out of the older moral and religious frameworks. The rise in medical discourses around children's sexuality in the late 19th century was famously theorised by Michel Foucault when he characterised the pedagogization of children's sex as one of four key mechanisms of knowledge and power centred around sex in the modern era. Among the first generation of sexual scientists, what was increasingly described as normal sexual development 
was widely considered to begin with the onset of physical puberty. Kraft Ebing, for example, characterised pre-adolescent sexual manifestations as premature and symptomatic of a congenital predisposition towards severe degenerative neuroses or psychoses. And he also pointed to criminal anthropologist, uh, criminal anthropologist Cesare Lombroso's identification of children affected with such a decided hereditary taint or premature and perverse sexual life. And this included one girl who, quote, masturbated shamelessly and almost constantly at the age of three. So there's very much an association of pre-adolescent sexuality with the premature, the precocious and the perverse. Other European scholars to investigate infant sexuality in the decade before Freud's and Moll's respective studies appeared include Budapest physician Samuel Lindner, who in 1879 published a paper on children's voluptuous thumb-sucking, Viennese physician Wilhelm Stiegel, who had written a piece on coitus in childhood in 1895, which was seven years before he first met Freud, German psychologist and philosopher Max de Soir, who described the development of the human sex drive, and the British sexologist Ellis, who coined the term autoerotism to describe children's onanistic sexual pleasures. And across the Atlantic as well, a number of, er of influential early American psychologists were um, making important contributions to these discussions. And these include G. Stanley Hall, who in 1904 published his study of adolescence, and Sanford Bell, who analysed what he called the emotion of sex love in about 2,500 cases of so-called healthy school children. Um, so the emphasis very, was very much on taking the study out of the clinic and looking at um, children in large institutions. Although Bell's categorisation of children who exhibited specific sexual excitement, as he called it, as precocious, echoed pathologising earlier accounts, such as Kraft Ebbing's, his finding that the emotion of sex love could manifest in children as young as three did break new ground, and it was subsequently cited not just by Freud and Moll, but also decades later by Alfred C. Kinsey in his post-war study of sexual behaviour in the human female. Like many of these researchers, even Freud in the 1890s had been reluctant to acknowledge an innate sexual drive as part of normal pre-adolescent experience. And this is something that um, Lutz Sauerteig points out in, in his research as well. Instead, at this stage in his career, Freud believed that early sexual behaviour resulted from abuse or seduction. But by the time he published his three essays, followed in 1909 by his famous case study of Little Hans, in which a young boy's phobia of horses was found to have decidedly sexual undertones, the founder of psychoanalysis had not only re revised his views on seduction, but come to view sexuality as a really essential and necessary aspect of infancy. So instead of the seduction theory, he began to prioritise the role of sexual fantasies and their repression instead of actual traumatic childhood experiences. The key achievement of the three essays lay in formulating a universal theory of infant sexual development that encompassed a series of pregenital, largely unconscious infantile processes. And this move pushed other researchers to consider much earlier stages of childhood through a sexual lens. Freud considered these stages crucial to explaining both normal maturation and also the development of so-called neuroses and perversions. And if we follow historian Sterling Fishman, the Freudian revolution meant that infant sexuality came to be viewed as a normal and natural expression, the suppression of which creates both individual and social problems. But Freud was never theorising in a vacuum, and in the next part of this paper I examine the ways in which the contest over infant sexuality sheds light on points of intersection, overlap and divergence between the two between the two consolidating disciplinary cultures of sexology and psychoanalysis. In the three essays, Freud spared himself the trouble of a detailed literature review and instead subsumed under an initial footnote all relevant sexological discussions to date. And as you can see here, that included works by Kraft Ebing, Moll, Bloch, Hirschfeld and Ellis. This strategic move freed him to draw on existing sexological theories as he chose, without cluttering with too many references a study for which he was claiming pioneering status. Yet historians have amply demonstrated the ways in which such existing studies very much laid the groundwork for Freud's elaborations, particularly Moll's study, whom 
Arnold, um, sorry, particularly Mole's previous work, um, not his sexual life of the child study, which came three years later. Arnold Davidson in particular describes Mole as having discovered infantile sexuality years before Freud. One of the more interesting findings to emerge from previous research on this cross-disciplinary relationship between the sexologists and the psychoanalysts is the degree of similarity between their thinking around 1900. Practitioners of both fields shared a fundamentally modern concept of the sexual instinct as a complex combination of the biological and the psychological. Mole, for example, despite insisting on congenital weakness as a factor in the development of perversions such as homosexuality, also took psychology very seriously. And he explored the possibilities of, hyp of hypnosis and even tentatively dream analysis. And similarly, Freud, of course, placed more emphasis on experiential and relational factors, but he also considered the role of heredity uh, quite carefully, particularly in relation to the sexual aberrations. Such shared ideas about the complex nature of the sexual instinct did not, however, equate to identical understandings of what constituted sexual behaviours and sensations in children, or when these were seen to begin. Certainly, in the sexual life of the child, Moll implicitly agrees with Freud that normal sexual manifestations commonly appear in children who have not yet reached puberty. And he even declares that we've been forced to admit the fact that in the child, sexual processes are much more extensive than has commonly been believed. Here he could draw not only on the work of scholars such as, as Bell, but also his own previous research, which seemed to disprove any direct link between childhood masturbation and adult perversions. So, for example, in his 1891 study of sexual inversion, Moll had reported on an epidemic of mutual masturbation at a Berlin boarding school, but he found that none of the boys later became homosexual. This was an early acknowledgement of child sexual activity as normal even prior to adolescence, and so it represented an important shift from the work of scholars such as Kraft Ebbing. But the similarities with Freud's study stop here in a way, because Freud's work was still quite typical of sexological thought around 1900, in that he acknowledged normal sexual activity only for the later stages of childhood, between the ages of around 8 and 14, and he described this as the second period of childhood. So Moll rejected Freud's enlarged definition of infant sexuality, and with it one of the most significant findings of the three essays. This dismissal went hand in hand with a broader rejection of Freud's sexual theory of the neurosis, as Moll warned against the exaggerations of those who interpret everything in sexual terms. Conditions such as hysteria, neurasthenia or anxiety, argued Moll, were far removed from any true relationship to the sexual life of the child. And he was equally critical of the psychoanalytic claim that a barrier of infantile amnesia prevented the memories of earliest childhood from being available to conscious recall and only recover recoverable through the new analytic method. And of course, Moll wasn't alone in his scepticism. As Zurich-based analyst Carl Gustav Jung observed in 1912, the very idea that children might be sexual and that sexual thoughts might play any part in their lives aroused great indignation. So I'll now turn my attention towards the reactions of Moll and several other contemporary sexologists to some of the main components of Freud's theory of infant sexuality. The first and possibly most provocative of these was the notion that the infant progressed through several stages of pregenital autoerotic sexuality, the first of which was an oral stage, characterised by rhythmic practices such as thumb sucking. Moll, however, viewed this as a clear case of over exaggeration. To follow Freud in considering the lips and fingers as erogenous zones, he argued, would mean that, quote, with just as much reason, every movement might be regarded as sexual as, for instance, the clenching by a child of its little fists." Unquote. Instead, Moll argued that infant self-stimulation merely responds to a specific genital sensation, such as distension of the bladder. And this meant that even erections or masturbation could be interpreted as non-sexual. So he gave the example of a boy in the countryside who, after watching a cow being milked, decided to try out the same action on his own penis. And Moll said, well, this is not necessarily a specifically sexual gesture. <clears throat> 
And it, he argued that only in extremely rare cases do children experience a voluptuous acne that can be in any way compared with adult genital sexuality. And such statements also did not go unnoticed by Freud, who remarked to those gathered in his apartment in 1908 that actually Moll regards sexuality as being really genitality. But a number of leading sexologists concurred with Moll's assessment of the oral stage. Zurich psychiatrist August Forel, who had directed the prestigious book Holtzli Clinic from 1879, pointed to a number of neurodevelopmental factors which he argued made the Freudian eroticization of infancy scientifically inadmissible. First, there is the fact that thumb sucking begins almost immediately after birth, when the cerebrum is still underdeveloped and relatively unreceptive. Secondly, infant sexual organs are still in an embryonic state, so biologically incapable of emitting sexual feelings into the spinal cord or basal ganglia. Furthermore, although Farrell agreed that it is without doubt that somewhat older children from, say, the age of three or four, occasionally experience vague sexual feelings, he insisted that this was a long way from declaring infant sexuality the, the rule, as Freud's school claims. Freud's formulation of the anal stage, meanwhile, highlighted children's capacity to use bowel movements as both a source of pleasure and a means of expressing compliance or disobedience. Like the oral phase, Freud argued that this stage of pregenital sexuality was observable by the third or fourth year of life. And he provided a vivid illustration of such infantile pleasures and protests in his case study of Little Hans, which was based on his friend uh, Max Graf's observations of his, young of his young son. Here Freud writes that, quite unexpectedly and certainly without any prompting by his father, Hans now began to be occupied with the lump complex, and to show disgust at things that reminded him of evacuating his bowels. And a year later, Jung offered a similar, um, a similar account of a girl that he dubbed Anna, whose neurosis he linked to the birth of her baby brother. And she was also fascinated by bodily orifices and came to associate the act of birth with that of excretion. Such discussions of an anal stage caused something of a commotion in sexological quarters. Although on this topic, responses were a bit more varied than they were in, in response to the, oral, um, the notion of an oral stage. Moll was prepared to accept that in a few children, erotic sensations might be associated with, quote, gentle scratching of the anal region and buttocks, unquote. But he flatly rejected any more universalizing formulations of the stage. And this included the notion that sexual pleasure might be gained from voluntary retention of the feces. I have not yet been able to satisfy myself, he writes, that these processes always, or even usually, have any connection with the sexual life. But a number of Moll's sexologist colleagues uh, begged to differ. Alice, who was always well informed of Germanophone developments, was among the most vocal supporters of Freud's linking of scatophilia and infant sexual life. And in many ways we could say that Alice occupied something of a middle position between Moll and Freud. Um, on the one hand, he praised Moll's sexual life as the, quote, most able and judicious book writ yet written on this subject. And he also agreed with Moll that the age of seven or, uh, seven or eight marked the key developmental moment after which childhood sexual expressions may be considered to come within the normal sphere, as he put it. But he also developed a more nuanced response to the psychoanalytic challenge than many of his German colleagues. Notably, Ellis had also begun to highlight the pleasurable sensations of urination, defecation, and also breastfeeding, even before the appearance of the three essays, leading Frank Sullaway to claim, as other scholars have done for Moll, that, he, that Ellis too anticipated much of the Freudian doctrine of infant sexuality. What I think is particularly interesting around, about Ellis's discussion of this pregenital stage is the way he pursued it beyond the scope of Freud's own arguments to consider the urinary as well as the anal excretory functions. These, as we know from biographical studies, constituted an abiding personal erotic as well as intellectual interest for Britain's leading sex psychologist, emphasising the, quote, intimate connection, physical and psychic, unquote, between the channels of urination and defecation and the sexual centres, Ellis described the excretory functions in quite glowing terms, 
as a, quote, rudimentary form of the artistic impulse, at the same time a manifestation of power, unquote. He suggests that not only are these pleasurable sensations equally applicable to the bladder as to the bowel, but that they may also, and here again his phrasing suggests that he might have been drawing on personal experience, they may also retain this function beyond infancy. Quote, it is certain that even in later life, the contents of the bladder are sometimes retained for the same reason, unquote. As we see from Ellis's more nuanced response to Freud's ideas on pregenital sexuality, analytic interventions didn't merely challenge sexological definitions of normal sexuality, but could also provide a productive impetus to further inquiry. Such deliberations around the sexual potential of the excretory functions also spurred wider inquiries among the psychoanalysts, so Otto Rank and Isidore Sadka both began considering questions of urethral eroticism around this period. Freudian formulations of the infant's polymorphous perversity presented a further point of intersection with sexological understandings. Freud argued that children are fundamentally open to all kinds of sexual influences and, irreg and irregularities before the mental barriers of shame and morality are fully constructed. And so he said that their desires initially take on a polymorphous character. As he explained in rather misogynistic terms, Infants, quote, are thus like an uncultivated woman whose sexuality may remain normal, but who can find all sorts of perversions to her taste under the influence of a clever seducer, unquote. There are, in fact, strong similarities between this position and Moll's articulation in Sexual Life of what he described as an undifferentiated sexual impulse, and Moll was building here on the works of German's, uh, German psychologist Max de Soir. Dessoir had argued that the earliest neutral stage of childhood is free of psychosexual attraction, but that it is followed by an undifferentiated stage where the sexual impulse could oscillate to and fro, could attach to various objects in the vicinity. And this could also result in uh, examples of homosexual affection. And then upon reaching maturity, this undifferentiated stage is replaced by a stage of differentiation where in most individuals the libido narrows its focus to heterosexual relationships, although of course in some perverse cases it remained in what de Soir terms an embryonic state. Moll made a few adjustments to de Soir's schema, not least by, uh, by insisting that the undifferentiated phase might occur at an earlier point, um, so before the age of 12 or 13, and he also uh, expanded on it by introducing a few case studies from his own clinical practice, uh, featuring patients who recalled their childhood crushes on tutors or friends' older siblings, or intimate relationships with students of the same sex. So Moll argued that these cases showed that by the age of eight, sexual attraction towards both sexes could be so frequently observed that, quote, at this time of life, these phenomena must be regarded not merely as not pathological, but further as not even abnormal, unquote. And he also used these cases to show how individuals who in childhood and adolescence had had homosexual crushes later developed in a heterosexual, in a heterosexual direction, such as one man who in his youth had experienced an immeasurable, an immeasurable passionate love for a fellow male pupil, but who by the age of 20 claimed that I am now, I believe, in every respect a healthy male. Ellis generally agreed, writing that, quote, there is normally in all boys and girls a trace of homosexual feeling and that early sexual impulses are for the most part harmless and that they may not be they may be uh, sorry they may be not just homosexual but also masochistic or sadistic fetishistic or incestuous Ellis also agreed with Moll, Dessoir and Freud that seeming signs of perversion in childhood shouldn't be too quickly interpreted as perverse he warned against too hastily concluding that quote the first delicate growths of what will later become a mighty instinct are perverse, any more than we are justified in protesting against the twisted shape of the young fronds of ferns. So this notion of polymorphous perversity was not particularly um, controversial for the sexologist. Far more contentious were Freud's ideas surrounding the Oedipus complex and the incestuous fantasies of infancy. Drawing on Greek mythology, Freud famously argued that the child, and as numerous critics have noted, his focus was clearly on the male child, 
must overcome their original incestuous and jealous impulses towards their parents. Detachment from the parents as the primary sexual object in turn forms the prerequisite for achieving appropriate read heterosexual responses in adult relationships and is something that everyone must master if they're not to fall victim to neurosis. While staking this universal claim, Freud also acknowledged its controversial status as the, quote, shibboleth that distinguishes the adherence of psychoanalysis from its opponents, unquote. Moll took a very different view towards the sexual feelings of childhood. And instead of uh, thinking, thinking about them in terms of incestuous possibilities, he emphasised their fundamental unknowability. We have to admit, wrote Moll, that above all in the mind of the child, the various feelings comprised under the idea of sympathy, friendship, affection for parents, love of children, sexual love, cannot always be marked off from each other, sorry, cannot always be marked, marked off each from the other after the manner of provinces on a map. Moll's insistence on a genital definition of sexuality also led him to dismiss as fruitless any attempt to, quote, distinguish a boy's love for his mother from his non-sexual friendship for a little girl, unquote. Hirschfeld, too, although generally much quieter on the topic of child sexuality, was quite sceptical of, of the Oedipal complex, although he didn't really articulate his position in detail until the 1920s. And by this point, his, um, his quite rocky relationship with the Freudians, who in 1908, I've said he was one of the um, members of this original um, Berlin Psychoanalytic Society that Karl Abraham had founded, but already three years later, he had... Um, removed himself from that society and, and um, was engaging in a lot of theoretical debate. But by the 1920s, I think that his position had reached something of an equilibrium, and this is reflected in his position of compromise in, with respect to Freudian theory. So on the one hand, he was prepared to acknowledge that the analysts had introduced concepts that were of considerable relevance to sexology, and these included the idea of repression. But for Hirschfeld, the Oedipus complex was really a step too far, um, if we remember that Hirschfeld is a very physiologically oriented researcher, his um, his homosexual activism was phrased, sorry, was was very much following the idea of justice through science. Um, that if nature has determined homosexuals to be in a certain way, congenitally speaking, then um, politics should respect that. Um, so for him, the Oedipus complex was an unnecessary and abstract detour that served only to refract attention away from sexuality's fundamental seat in the body. <coughs> As a result, Hirschfeld in 1917 declared the Freudian attribution of incestuous tendencies to all children to be completely erroneous. And he argued that this assessment holds, even if it is possible to acknowledge in a child's love for, for parents or siblings, a, quote, lightly erotic undercurrent that does not fully penetrate the consciousness, unquote. And again, Ellis tread a more, uh, more of a middle line. He was quite willing to contemplate the, expl the explanatory power of the Oedipus complex, um, and he also welcomed psychoanalytic formulations of the incest inhibitions. And again, he also expanded on Freud's um, elaborations by discussing the suckling mother's emotions towards her child, Ellis argued that, like in lovers, these, quote, reveal a tenderness, passion and absorption, which are not far removed from the emotions of a woman towards her lover, unquote. And once again, Ellis had already begun to arrive at this conclusion several years before the three essays were published. And his, 19, his 1900 essay on the analysis of the sexual impulse, where he compared the maternal transfer of fluids between mother and child to sexual intercourse, seems to have influenced Freud's subsequent writings on this topic. So psychoanalytic theories of the child challenge sexologists to consider the possibility that a significantly expanded range of behaviours and experiences might be designated as sexual in a normal sense. At its most productive, the ensuing dialogue provided an impetus to new avenues of sexological inquiry, and we see this in Ellis's theorisation particularly of breastfeeding or of urinary eroticism. Yet Freudian ideas also threatened the classificatory authority being claimed by sexology. The rejection by Moll, Farrell and Hirschfeld of psychoanalytic innovations such as the Oedipus complex must thus be understood on several levels, 
Firstly, is a scepticism on behalf of these more physiologically oriented sexual scientists towards what they consider to be psychoanalysis's less, less empirically demonstrable theories, but also as an example of professional defensiveness and of disciplinary boundary drawing. But it's also important to note that Freud's account of infantile development sowed seeds of dissent among, among fellow psychoanalysts. In 1912, Jung used a lecture series to challenge not only Freud's understandings of pregenital sexuality, but also, and more fundamentally, his mentor's formulation of the libido. With this critique, Jung joined sceptics such as Moll and Farrell in disputing Freud's characterisation of gestures such as sucking as sexual pleasures, and instead Jung argued that the first period of life is focused only on the, fa on the functions of nutrition and growth and characterised by an absence of any sexual function. Jung also counted or expanded upon Freud's theorisation of the Oedipus complex by considering female sexual development in terms of a parallel but distinct Electra complex, although his intervention on that topic remained a rather vague and fleeting one, as Jill Scott emphasises. These debates also did not remain static, particularly when in the 1910s and 1920s, new research into the endocrinal glands and hormones added new layers of complexity to understandings of children's physiological and psychological development. And these also led Freud to sub substantially revise a section of his three essays on the chemical theory, although it didn't, it didn't lead him to fundamentally transform his theoretical framework, and I think that that's an important point. But he did find it necessary to engage closely with the new theories of um, Eugen Steinach and Co. in Vienna um, and, of the, and with endocrinal research more broadly. A, re a reorientation towards the physiological is also foreshadowed by Moll in Sexual Life, when he observes that the chemical theories of the glands, sorry, the chemical theory of the glands has recently gained ground over the older nervous theory, even if their precise functioning was still unclear. Whereas Freud's three essays had forced sexologists to sit up and take notice of unconscious and relational factors, inner secretions research was promising sexologists an opportunity to regain some of the scientific authority they had been forced to concede. And this tale of how the pendulum began to swing back from an increasingly psychologised fra framework of sexual modernity at the turn of the century to a renewed focus on the body's orga organic functions in, in the 1920s represents a crucial development in the relationship between these two fields as the, as the century progressed. The history of sexuality's future, observes Helmut Puff, depends on our ability to continually rewrite, revise and redo existing research agendas. In recent years, as I outlined at the beginning of this paper, scholars have increasingly emphasised how this redoing must entail a more, a more comprehensive historicising of the normal as a category shaping sexual knowledge in the early 20th century. Fin de siècle efforts to understand children's sexual development, I've argued here, form part of a broader prioritisation of the normal within modern sex research and signalled a move away from the dominant 19th century focus on sexual pathologies. In particular, the Freudian insistence that normal sexual development begins from birth challenged sexologists to revisit their assumptions about infancy and puberty, even as this mutually influential dialogue produced fruitful new avenues of, sexological and, sorry, of sexual scientific inquiry. Thank you very much for your attention.